Cartus de Matas Curat starts out saying Britain is known for many things, tea time for instance, or the famous British humor, or the notorious British understatement. Iconic status can be ascribed to the Queen and British luxury limousines. One example is the Bentley Mulsanne. And since it's supposed to be a chauffeur-driven limousine, Matas will have to split himself in two. The car tester doesn't usually sit in the rear, but he'll make an exception this time. His passenger self gives orders to his chauffeur self, and together they hit the road. Bentley was long the sister brand of Rolls-Royce. In the late 1990s, it was acquired by Volkswagen. The current model Muzan was unveiled in 2009. The nearly 2.6-ton limousine is powered by a 377-kilowatt twin-turbocharged V8 gasoline engine. Chauffeur Mata says the best place in the car is in front, behind the wheel. Passenger Matas is delighted with the electronically adjustable rear seats with a standard massage function. He revels in the luxury. Oder eine Massagefunktion serienmäßig. Das ist schon sehr angenehm. Die gibt es übrigens auch. Chauffeur Matas points out that the front seats have the same features and more. But the proximity control system does cost extra, and there's no lane assist. A digital radio is standard in Europe and delivers the finest sound quality, even in the rear seats. Or the passengers can always get out the wireless headset and take in their own entertainment program. And here hinten. sein ganz eigenes Unterhaltungsprogramm genießen. For the visual part, they can monitor the chauffeur's driving on an optional screen. The luxury comes at a price, starting at just under 300,000 euros in Germany. So the high fuel consumption rated at 16.9 liters of super plus per 100 kilometers shouldn't be a major concern, though it can reach 20 liters for city driving and the automatic deactivation of four cylinders doesn't save that much. The Mulsanne is nearly 40 centimeters longer than the long version of the BMW 7 or the Mercedes-Benz S-Class, but for that, it isn't too showy. There's lots of chrome trim. Still, it's not overdone. It's tasteful and coherent. The doors have power closing aids. Piano finish, leather, and lots of chrome dominate the interior of our test version. The seats can be cooled as well as heated. Once you've taken a seat in here, you won't want to give it up again, except to trade it for another in the back. Here, luxury takes on a new meaning. A knob moves the front passenger seat forward to provide more leg room. Elegant tables fold down from the front backrests, and a press of a button can shade the windows and keep people from looking in from the outside. That applies to the rear windshield, too, of course. And if more seat space is needed, the center console can be folded up to accommodate three people comfortably. But there's no such thing as a car for every occasion, and the Mulsanne proves the rule. Matas points out that with its length of 5.6 meters, the Mulsanne can barely fit into most of Germany's parking garages. We're not even going to try it this time. It's designed to be a chauffeured limousine for those few able to spare the chunk of change it costs. 
Matis concludes that the first time you sit in a Bentley Mosan, you may be overwhelmed by the attention to detail that's gone into it. But once you've been around the block in it a few times, you realize it isn't 100% perfect. Personally, from a 300,000 euro car, he'd expect perfection when it comes to the door molding in front, for instance. But then you always have to have room for improvement. And back, passenger Matis couldn't discover anything to complain about. He found the seats comfortable and everything is electronically adjustable. The air conditioning, the heating and cooling for the seats, and the leg room. For the chauffeur too, this car is a dream, but all for a price. A price he wouldn't be willing to pay. Nor could he live with the high fuel costs. Reicht es noch nicht ganz für den hohen Anschaffungspreis und auch die immensen Benzinkosten. We flew to Spain to test the third generation of the Seat Leon SC in its home country. We wanted to see if this version lives up to the sporty image its makers are promoting. We'll be checking its performance in everyday city driving, as well as the space it offers passengers and luggage, between the smooth roof and the smart rear end. Test driver Reinhold Deisenhofer points out that the previous Seat Leon had five doors. Now there's a three-door version. The SC stands for Sport Coupe. Seat is hoping it will appeal to a new market segment, younger, more dynamic drivers. Seat offers a range of nine engines for the SC, five gasoline-powered and four diesels. We tried out the 110 kilowatt two liter diesel with a six speed double clutch transmission and an automatic start stop mechanism. It accelerates from zero to 100 in 8.4 seconds, reaching a maximum speed of 211 kilometers per hour. Reinhold says the Leon SC is a sporty but comfortable chassis. It feels dynamic and light-footed. That might be because it's the lightest car in its class, weighing in at only 1,100 kilos. He says compared to the five-door version, the SC has a slimmer A-pillar. That gives the driver somewhat better visibility straight ahead and a smaller blind spot. The side view shows the Leon SC's sporty profile. In particular, the designers noticeably sharpen the front and widen the grill. The lines and the details, air scoops and headlights, are in the classic trapeze form. Even the side mirrors with their integrated turn signals are like little works of art. To Reinhold, the most noticeable difference is that it's now a three-door instead of a five-door. It's also a bit shorter, wider and somewhat lower. And from behind, that makes it look much more like a sports sedan and not as much like the usual compact car. Harmonizing with the gently sloped rear is a somewhat more lower windshield. From the side, sharp lines all around dynamically connect the rear with the front. The SC's wheelbase is shorter by some three and a half centimeters. That brings up the question of the space offered by the interior. With two doors missing, the first task is to enter the vehicle. But once we're in, we hardly notice any difference to the bigger version. There's plenty of head and leg room, and the three-door version has every bit as much trunk space as the five-door Lyon. The SC's interior is pleasantly straightforward. 
almost all the car's functions can be operated with the touch-sensitive color display on the center console. That cuts out many of the buttons and leaves the cockpit looking tidy. The trapeze lines turn up again on the vents and door handles. The instrument panel displays all the key data front and center in the driver's field of view. The overall harmonious concept reinforces the car's personality, and our test driver noticed something else. He points out one detail that Seat is especially proud of, the quality workmanship. An example is that the crack of the rubber door seals is narrower than on its more expensive Volkswagen counterparts. But assist systems like the adaptive high beam and lane assist with drowsiness detection are only available as options. Einhold concludes that the Seat Leon SC is not just a leaner version of its five-door brother, but a model in its own right. It handles well and boasts excellent workmanship, and it cuts a handsome figure. The Leon SC starts at 14,890 euros in Germany, but the model we tested with the second most powerful diesel and DSG transmission would cost 25,540 euros. Our test driver Sasha finds himself in an old quarry in the mountains, the perfect setting to test an SUV. Although Sasha says that SUVs aren't necessarily built to drive on this kind of terrain. That's why we're hitting the road to put today's car through its paces. It's the second generation Ford Kuga. We tested a model with a 2-liter diesel engine and 120 kilowatts of power. The four-wheel drive version cost 32,000 euros in Germany. This is the most popular of the diesel models. The powerful four-cylinder turbo engine drives the car forward, creating 340 newton meters of torque. The Kuga can reach a speed of 100 kilometers per hour in 9.9 .9 seconds, with a top speed of 198 kilometers per hour nothing out of the ordinary for this type of car. Sasha says the diesel engine is very powerful, as he expected. The handling on the second generation model is satisfactory too. Of course, the CO2 emissions aren't great. The Kuga gives off 154 grams of CO2 per kilometer. But as Sasha says, anyone who wants a more environmentally friendly car would obviously buy something smaller to get around with anyway. Ford has introduced several new safety features. Up to 12 driver assistance systems can be requested, from a lane assistant with a driver fatigue detector to the active city stop system and parking guides. Sasha's in the driver's seat and says there are a lot of buttons on the dashboard. But he says anyone interested in buying the car will have tried them all out and know what they all do. And anyway, during the journey you'll only need to use a few of them, so they're only a little distracting. Another small criticism Sasha has is that the display of the sat-nav is smaller than the display on his cell phone. He thinks that Ford should make it bigger, so that it's easier to read and causes less confusion for the driver. The Kuga's design is simple and elegant. The lines give the compact SUV a sporty and robust appearance. The contours of the hood are stronger than on the first generation model. The new Kuga is 8 centimeters longer, 8 millimeters lower, and 4 millimeters slimmer than its predecessor, which makes it more spacious and less wind resistant. We 
Sasha is looking at the different pillars on the car. He says that while most of them won't affect the driver's vision too much, but at the rear windscreen, it's another matter. Sasha points to the area where the driver's field of vision begins. To the right of that, the glass is black. That means there's a blind spot, and Sasha says a driver wouldn't be able to see children shorter than 1.2 meters standing there. But hopefully, the parking sensors would pick them up. Or the driver would see them in the rearview camera. Sasha then shows us how you can open the trunk without getting your hands dirty. The sensor under the car pops it open automatically. That sensor costs a bit extra, though. Sasha says the extra 8 centimeters in back seat legroom are really noticeable. Both front seats are all the way back, and he still has a good 12 centimeters of room. The back seats can be folded over as well. If the back seats are folded completely, the space in the trunk goes up from 481 liters to 1,653 liters. So Sasha's verdict on the second generation Ford Kuga, he says the facelift is an improvement. It's more angular, masculine and concise. The 120 kilowatt diesel engine isn't the best for the environment, but for people who will be carrying heavy loads might need the power. If you're looking for a more ecologically friendly model, then go for something smaller or maybe one of the petrol models. You can save some money that way as well. The BMW Z8 isn't an old-timer yet, but it's definitely a classic. It made its debut at the 1999 Frankfurt Motor Show. It looks a lot like the 507, especially the grille. The BMW Z8 is one of his favorite cars. Z8 owner Leopold from Bayern tells us. The grille is wonderfully designed. Underneath it, there's the spoiler, which generates downforce. The headlights are an absolute dream. Look how they're integrated into the front end. And then we have these wide mud guards to accommodate the large tires with their hubcaps. The BMW Z8 proved an immediate hit when it came on the market in the year 2000. The elegant design concealed some excellent performance standards. What makes the Z8 so much fun to drive is the motor, Leopold tells us. It's got 400 horsepower. It's an M5 motor with 500 newton meters. So, of course, it's got a lot of power. Then there's the 32 valve and a V8 motor. It's a real rocket. The Z8 was designed by Henrik Fiske. In terms of shape, the BMW kidney grille and side air vents recall the BMW 507, which made its premiere way back in 1955. The convertible was completely built by hand. It cost 235,000 Deutschmarks, or around 119,000 euros. Only 5,703 were made, so it's a rarity. The Z8's rounded back end also calls to mind typical 1950s and 60s roadsters. But the chassis still seems modern, timeless. The heart and soul of the car, says Leopold, is the V8 motor with 400 horsepower and 500 newton meters. Back then it was the first M5 motor that was truly powerful. Leopold has made a few modifications to make the car more stable. He's a sporty driver because he races cars. So he had the chassis reinforced, and that's really great. For him, it's a dream car. The Z8 can go from 0 to 100 kilometers an hour in under 5 seconds, so no wonder it's anything but quiet. Leopold says that he always compares the noise of the motor to a bellowing grizzly bear that's mad about something. Let's have a listen, he says. You can really hear the power, he says. 
As far as the interior is concerned, Leopold likes the combination of beige leather with piano black. The instruments in the middle recall those of a mini. They include a tachometer, a water temperature gauge, a speedometer, and gas tank display. The steering wheel is marvelous, Leopold says, with its spokes and built-in airbag. The driver sits comfortably and has a good overview of the entire inside of the vehicle. James Bond drove a Z8 in the film, The World is Not Enough. Leopold says that what's most fascinating about the car is the design, which is beautifully realized. Leopold predicts that in 30 or 40 years, the car will have achieved the same status as the 507 has now, but with a fantastic motor, the M5. The Z8 uses a lot of fuel, but otherwise it's quite comparable with everyday driving. Leopold says that the Z8 requires little maintenance and is very reliable. The only thing is that it eats up a lot of gas because of its 400 horsepower, but everything else is all right. Depending on how it's driven, the Z8 needs 15 to 20 liters of gasoline per 100 kilometers. It's not for those who pinch pennies. Leopold says it's very difficult to find one to buy one of these cars because they've become collector's items and the price is constantly going up. He found his on the internet and says that he bought it because it was the most beautiful sports car he's ever seen. Leopold says he thinks it will take a while before there's anything to rival the Z8.